Okay, wonderful students. We are now moving on to management of patients with oral and esophageal disorders. A bidirectional relationship exists between oral health and diet, as well as nutrition. Diet and nutrition affect the health of the tissues in the mouth, and the health of the mouth affects the nutrients consumed. There's a proven relationship between the oral and general health. It is reported, for example, that diabetes is linked with the development and progression of periodontitis. Moreover, there is a casual link between high consumption of sugars and diabetes, obesity, and dental cavities. Oral health is closely related with general health and people's quality of life through affecting their oral functions and social interactions. For example, dental caries or cavities may cause impaired chewing, decreased appetite, sleep problems, and poor school or work performance. Signs of several systemic diseases and conditions can be manifested in the mouth, which makes the oral cavity an important diagnostic tool for health professionals. The mouth, the lungs, intestines, and genitory tract are potential entry sites through which a multitude of bacteria may gain access to the body. Poor oral health can affect appetite and the ability to eat, result in malnutrition, and hence compromise general health and well-being. Indeed, inadequate food or nutrient intake may result from dental cavities, periodontal disease, oral and dental pain, tooth loss, dry mouth, ill-fitting dentures, cracked or sore lips, cracked or sore tongue, and sensitivity to temperatures. Periodontal or gum disease is an infection of the tissues that holds your teeth in place. It's typically caused by poor brushing and flossing habits that allow plaque, a sticky film of bacteria, to build up on the teeth and harden. It starts with swollen, red, and bleeding gums. If left untreated, it can spread to the bones surrounding the gums, making it painful to chew. In the worst cases, teeth may become loose or need to be removed. The bacteria from periodontal diseases may increase your risk of those toxins and they can travel into the bloodstream. These toxins can cause inflammation in your arteries and can create a blockage there. These bacteria can also cause respiratory diseases, pneumonia, heart disease, coronary artery disease, strokes, diabetes, and ulcers. Bacteria from your gun, gums releases toxins. Degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis is a type of arthritis that occurs when flexible tissue at the end of bones wears down. The wearing down of protected tissue at the ends of bones or your cartilage occurs gradually and worsens over time. Joint pain in the hands, neck, lower back, knees, or hips is the most common symptom. Medications, physical therapy, and sometimes surgery can help reduce pain and maintain joint movement. Degenerative joint disease, again, also known as osteoarthritis, or OA, is a common wear and tear disease. The underlying cause of this condition is typically chronic, chronic repetitive motion that results in inflammation and structural joint damage. There are certain factors that make it more likely for patients to develop this disease, and they include aging, being overweight or, or obese, history of an injury or surgery to a joint, overuse from repetitive movements of the joint, joints that do not form correctly, or a familial history of osteoarthritis. Parotitis is inflammation of the uh, parotid gland and is the most common inflammation of the major saliv uh, sal the saliva glands, right? And parotitis can present as a local process or a manifestation of systemic illness. Sildentitis is inflammation of the salivary gland. Sildentitis of the submandular gland is less common than that of the parotid gland. Acute sildentitis is usually due to a bacterial or even a viral infection, and it usually presents with rapid onset pain and swelling. Okay, so it's something that like pops up out of the blue, pain and swelling. 
Symptoms usually begin to subside within about 48 hours of being treated with antibiotics. And soleolithus or salivary stones are the hardened mineral deposits that form in the back of the throat there in the salivary glands. Promoting mouth care and preventive oral care like brushing, right? Brushing your teeth. Um, so we wanna use fluoride toothpaste as it prevents decay by strengthening the tooth's harder outer surface called enamel. We wanna angle the bristles toward the gum line so that when they clean between the gums and the teeth, it gets in there really good. Um, we wanna brush gently using a small circular motion Again, we do not want to scrub hard back and forth, right? Um, we want to brush all sides of each tooth. So again, brush all sides of each tooth. Then you want to brush your tongue, right? And we should be doing this at least twice daily for at least two minutes at a time using, again, a fluoride tooth paste. Um, we do need to floss daily to remove plaque from areas that the toothbrush can't reach reach and we need we need to use a high quality dental floss to make cleaning easier right um, we should encourage our patients to eat a healthy diet rich in nutrients that can help prevent gum disease some of these might include like vitamin a vitamin c we need to um, educate our patients to avoid smoking cigarettes and any other form of tobacco which can definitely contribute to oral cancer as well as gum disease um, we need to encourage them to visit a reputable dentist for regular exams and cleanings, um, which of course is the most effective way to diagnose early signs of gum disease, right? And we should do that. We should visit our dentist, reliable dentist, at least twice annually. We need to get dental care before surgery or radiation therapy um, because they can cause deteriorations to the gum. We need to encourage fluid intake to reduce dry mouth. Um, we can use synthetic saliva, such as um, oral balance, or even like a saliva production stimulant, right, to help produce more saliva. Um, we need to ensure adequate food and fluid intake. We need to assess the nutritional requirements and dietary patterns of our patient. We need to assess the patient preferences and definitely take that into account when we're preparing the you know, nutritional and diet. Um, we need to look at social and cultural factors when encouraging and recommending dietary intake. Um, definitely support a positive image, encourage, encourage our patients to verbalize um, and also to listen and offer acceptance and support. Also, actually refer them to support groups as well, right? Because it's always helpful to have support groups um, when you're going through anything. Um, we might have a psychiatric liaison or a spiritual advisor that could take many forms, right, for the patient. It really just depends on the patient and their beliefs. To minimize pain, we need to educate to avoid any food that are hot to the touch, spicy, or hard, right? And we need to advise a client to use gauze or a sponge toothette to clean the oral mucosa when, patient, when, you know, when pain prevents us to use a toothbrush, right? Um, also, it's recommended that we use water or normal saline or maybe even a viscous lidocaine because that helps numb the mouth and the pain, right? Or even a chlorhexidine mouthwash twice daily as prescribed to complement the other oral care procedures that we're doing when a patient has, you know, painful sores. Um, we also need to use normal saline mouthwash for patients with those oral lesions, right? And the frequency of oral hygiene should be determined by patient comfort level and the status of the patient's oral cavity. Uh, but it should be performed at least tw twice a day. So nursing assessment and rationales, we need to assess the ability to swallow by positioning the examiner's thumb and index finger on the patient's laryngeal prob, uh, protuberance and have them swallow, right? And when they simulate the swallow, if they cough, then that's indicative of them aspirating, okay? We need to evaluate the strength in, of the facial muscles. We need to check for coughing or choking during eating and drinking. 
In many cases, it's not possible to treat dysphagia, and the aims of care are to maintain nutrition and hydration, right? Reduce the risk of aspiration pneumonia, as well as ensure that the person is able to take their medication safely, right? Dysphagia intervention may concentrate on swallowing exercises. It could be compensatory swallowing strategies like postural considerations. It might include bolus consistency modification. It could be patient education. It could be caregiver education, right? It could look like a lot of things. Esophageal disorders affects the patient's esophagus. That's the tube that carries the food from their mouth to their stomach, right? And the most common type of disorder is GERD or gastric esophageal reflux disorder, right? Um, also Barrett's esophagus, right? Causing heartburn or swallowing problems, it increases the patient's risk for esophageal cancer. And there are medications and dietary and lifestyle changes that can help reduce uh, the signs and symptoms of GERD, right? Common symptoms of esophagitis include difficulty swallowing. The patients typically have painful swallowing. Um, food might become stuck in the esophagus, so they get food impactions, right? That's what that is. Um, they may have chest pain, especially behind the breastbone when they eat, right? They usually will have heartburn and acid regurgitation. Um, again, all gastroesophageal reflux disease symptoms, right? Risk for uh, GERD includes chances of them um, developing esophageal disorders. So factors like alcohol use, right? Excessive weight, um, like obesity or um, excessive weight. Maybe when they get pregnant, they have excessive weight, you know, on top of the baby weight, not just, not the baby, but the excessive weight. Sometimes when people get pregnant, right, they put on a lot of weight. It could be medications induced, like antibiotics or antidepressants, or pain reliever medic medications can cause GERD, right? Uh, radiation therapy to the patient's neck or chest could cause GERD. Smoking, right? Um, and even, in like that would include secondhand smoke potentially could cause it. Symptoms of uh, this disorder might include abdominal pain, chest pain, could be back pain, uh, chronic cough, sore throat, difficulty swallowing again, or feeling like you've got something stuck in your throat, could be heartburn, you know, that burning feeling in the chest. It could be hoarseness, wheezing, uh, indigestion, burning feeling in the stomach, could be regurgitation of the stomach acid or contents coming back up the esophagus, right, into the mouth, could be vomiting, could even be unexplained weight loss, right? There's a lot of signs and symptoms. Again, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease is the most common esophageal disorder, and it occurs when the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't close properly, right? And so as a result, stomach acid repeatedly flows back into the tube connecting your mouth and the stomach, right? So it comes back up into the esophagus. This backwash or acid reflux can, can and does irritate the lining of the esophagus. Again, signs and symptoms include burning sensation in the chest or heartburn, usually after eating, um, which may be worse at night or when the patient lies down, backwash or regurgitation of food or sour liquid, upper abdominal or chest pain, dysphagia or trouble swallowing, sensation of lumps in the patient's throat, nighttime acid reflux, sometimes they'll have an ongoing cough, They'll get inflammation of the vocal cords or laryngitis. They may have new asthma or worsening asthma. Again, conditions that can increase a patient's risk of getting GERD include obesity, um, hiatal hernias, which is a bulging of the top of the stomach over the diaphragm. Could be pregnancies, connective tissue disorders like scleroderma, it could be delayed stomach emptying, 
Um, and some factors that can aggravate acid reflux include smoking, eating large meals, eating late at night, and then especially going right to bed, eating certain foods, triggers like fatty foods, fried foods, those kinds of things, drinking certain beverages like alcohol or coffee, right? Really acidic foods. Um, taking certain medications like aspirin, right? Management of GERD includes having a low fat diet, avoiding alcohol, avoiding tobacco, avoiding beer, avoiding milk, um, avoiding foods that contain peppermint or spearmint, avoiding carb beverage, carbonated beverages, um, avoiding eating or drinking two hours before bed, um, making sure that you elevate the head of the bed by at least 30 degrees. Some medications that we would take for GERD, um, you know, let's say, for example, if there are mild GERD symptoms, we might, in addition to lifestyle changes, we might initiate a mild GERD medication like a non-prescription antacid or maybe an, a histamine receptor antagonist, right? Um, so maybe like Tums or Maalox, um, that would help neutralize stomach acid um, and are commonly used for short-term relief of heartburn symptoms, right? Maybe prescription medications might include a proton pump inhibitor or an H2 receptor antagonist, right? We also want to recommend that the patient maintains a healthy weight, stop smoking. Um, make sure that they don't lie down after a meal. Eat their food slowly and chew very thoroughly. They want to avoid foods or drinks that trigger their reflux, right? And this can vary from patient to patient, right? Um, other things that might help. Don't wear tightly fitting clothing, right? The different types of nutritional um, delivery include, we have oral nutritional support, for example, maybe fortified food, additional snacks or um, feeds. Then next to oral, uh, we have enteral tube feedings, right? So this delivery of nutritionally complete feeds is directly given into the gut via a tube. We have parenteral route. That delivery is through nutrition intravenously. So enteral nutrition is nutrition delivered using the gut. This can refer to oral, gastric, or post-pyloric feeds. There are many indications requiring a feeding tube to, to deliver nutrition or hydration. This is known as tube feeding, enteral feeding, or gavage. Enteral nutrition is defined as the delivery of nutrients beyond the esophagus via feeding tubes and the oral intake of dietary foods for special uh, medical purposes, right? It should be provided in patients with at least partial, partially functioning gut, okay, whose energy and nutrient needs cannot be met by regular food intake, right? So again, they have the ability to consume at least part of their functioning gut, but they can't get all of their nutrition in that way. So the advantages of doing this is safe and cost effective. It does pre preserve the GI integrity, right? So we're using it because it's there. It preserves the normal intestinal and hepatic metabolism effect. It maintains fat metabolism. It also maintains lipoprotein synthesis, and it helps maintain normal insulin and glucagon ratios within in the body, right? Okay, so administering tube feeding. So we have nasogastric, we have nasoduodenal, nasojejunal, and we have percutaneous endoscopic gastro, gastrostomy or PEG tubes, right? Tube feeding is nutrition provided through the GI tract via a tube, a catheter, or a surgically made hole in the GI tract. As previously mentioned, it is the preferred method of feeding when patients are unable to eat enough calories on their own, right? Enteral access devices are feeding tubes placed directly into the GI tract to deliver nutrients as well as additional fluids and often is a method for delivering medications. Well, you will see this in long-term care. Nasal or oral tubes may be placed at the bedside with endoscopy or surgically. 
Anasoenteric tube means that the tube enters the nose at the end of it may be a, uh, it, you know, so again, nasoenteric tube means that the tube enters the nose and the end of it may be in the stomach, it may be in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, um, or it may be in the jejunum, which is the second part of the small intestine. So it can go down into different parts, right? And we have gastrostomy and jejunostomy tubes. Um, these are inserted through the skin, which we call percutaneous, right? And what happens is the surgeon will um, insert a small incision in the upper abdominal wall, and then they'll take the gastrostomy or the jejunostomy tubes and insert, insert them through that abdominal wall, right? And this may be done by a radiologist with an x-ray guidance or it may be done by an endo, endo, uh, endoscopy um, or surgically right by a surgeon original placement is confirmed by an x-ray and subsequent placement is confirmed uh, typically with litmus paper clearing a tube obstruction so the way we do that is we are going to use the push and pull technique so we're going to fill a 50 milliliter syringe with warm water we're gonna connect it to the tube. We're going to push and pull on the syringe like using a bicycle pump to try to dislodge the blockage. This could take up to 30 minutes before the tube becomes unblocked, okay? If this doesn't work, then we are going to administer an enzymatic agent or a mechanical uh, device like a tube clear system. Um, and we might also administer Coca-Cola and leave in there, or maybe even meat tenderizers or acidic juices, anything that's going to help uh, deteriorate that blockage, right? Good care of your patient's skin will prevent it from becoming inflamed or irritated and breaking down. So it's very, very important that we also keep really good care of our patient's skin, right? Clean and dry, right? So again, keep the skin around the NG tube clean by using warm water and a washcloth, right? And then you wanna pat it dry so that it remains clean and dry. We wanna remove any crusts or secretions around the nose. When changing tapes, we want to use adhesive remover, if available, to prevent damaging the skin, especially with the elderly. Remember, their skin is so thin. We want to make sure the skin is clean and dry before applying new tape. Again, don't rub dry. You want to pat dry. If you notice redness or irritation on any side of the face, you may consider putting the NG tube in the other nostril, all right, um, as long as it's patent. Remember, patients equipped with the NG tube must maintain good oral hygiene and the need to clean their noses regularly, right? Removing the feeding tube. First of all, we want to remove the tape from the patient's nose. Then we're going to grab the tube right outside the nostril. And in one motion, we're going to pull the tube quickly, not too crazy quick, but just quickly in a solid one motion. Um, and you're going to pull it out, and I would recommend that you have a chucks pad that you're pulling it into, right? And so um, you just pull it out in one swift motion, and you're going to use the other hand, finish pulling out the tube all the way out, okay? You're going to go quickly, because if you go slowly, it can definitely cause the patient to gag more, way more, right? And they could end up vomiting, so just be careful, okay? Okay, so we have enteral nutritional feeding schedules. We have boluses, which are small volumes over a small time frame, right? And usually it's done by gravity or maybe a push method. And we're going to show you on the next slides what that is. Intermittent feeding is same as a bolus, except it's on an infusion pump and that's used to deliver the feeding. Cyclical is larger volumes over a larger time frame. And then we have continuous feeds, which is set the amount infusing at a set rate hourly. Now, what I'm going to tell you about the continuous feeds is this. Do not fill a tube feeding bag up with, uh, you know, the whole day's worth your whole shift 12 hour worth of feeds because as the tube feeding sits in those bags they thicken over time and it will lead to a blockage right a tube feeding blockage so don't do that okay only put in a couple hours worth of feeds at a time in that continuous tube feeding
Okay, here's a picture of a bolus feed. So you see here is bolus feeding using gravity. This method uses a syringe without the plunger um, to do the enteral nutrition, right? So what we do literally is pour the nutrition into that open barrel and it flows down into the tube into the patient literally by gravity. Here's a picture of continuous feeding. Again, this is delivering enteral nutrition over a 24 hour period, right? Um, and then we have the intermittent bolus feeding, which is divine, defined as delivering enteral nutrition multiple times, generally in like in increments of 30 minutes at a time, right? Um, and then maybe every two to three hours. And it's either done by gravity or a pump like this, right? An electric pump. Here's a picture of a peg tube, right? Remember, the peg tube goes through the skin, percutaneous, through the skin, endoscopic, gastro gastrostomy, right? So again, the surgeon's going to insert an endoscope, right? That thin, flexible tube with the tiny camera and a light on the tip. They insert that through the mouth and into the stomach to guide that G-tube into place, right? Um, here's the dressing for the peg tube. And again, it should be clean and dry, just like it is. Um, we change it at least daily, uh, but more fre frequently if it gets wet or dirty. Absolutely, but at least daily. Uh, okay, assessment of a patient receiving enteral feeding. We're always going to check tube placement prior to using that tube for anything, food or meds or anything, right? Fluids. Um, we're also going to check the patient's ability to tolerate the type of feeding that we're going to give or the formula that we're going to give, as well as the amount, right? Being aware that when a patient is sick, you're definitely probably going to have to slow down those feeds, right? Because they're not going to be able to tolerate them as fast. Um, and you may need to also even switch off to a different type of nutrition when, when a patient's sick, right? So we're going to be evaluating the patient basically all the time for their clinical response to the feeds, for any signs and symptoms of dehydration, for any elevated blood glucose levels, any kind of decrease in urinary output, any kind of sudden weight gain. We're going to look for uh, periorbital or dependent edema. We're going to be checking all the time for signs and symptoms of infection. Like you're going to be continually assessing your patient, right? And we'll want to check for gastric residual volume or GRV, gastric residual volume. That is the amount of liquid drained from the stomach following administration of enteral feeds, right? So this liquid uh, this liquid will literally consist mainly of infused nutritional formula or water or, or gastric juices, right? So it's a mixture of all of that. So you're literally going to measure the gastric residual volume using a syringe or by, you know, um, drainage to the reservoir and you're going to do this you're going to assess this residual volume every four to six hours anytime a patient's on continuous feeds right to ensure that they're actually digesting the formula that you're putting in them you're also going to check it before each intermittent feeding and any volume over 200 milliliters or more needs to be investigated as to why there is a residual volume of 200 milliliters or more, okay? Very important. We're also going to keep track of I's and O's, weekly weights. Um, we're also going to make sure that if they're getting these kind of feeds that they're, they have a dietitian uh, consult regularly, all of those things, right? Being our patient's advocate. Administer feeding at prescribed rate and method and according to the patient's tolerance, right? Administer water before and after each medication and each feeding. You want to give water every four to six hours as well. And whenever the tube feeding is discontinued or interrupted, you want to flush with water. Do not mix medications with feedings. You need to administer them separately. And you will notice when you go to the long-term care facilities, they tend to give all of the medications in the peg feeding tubes 
all together, right? As long as they're compatible, you can do that, okay? Um, but again, you do not ever want to put your medications in the tube feedings, okay? You want to give it separately because one, you want to make sure they get it, and two, you can't chart that they got the meds until after they take them, right? So you definitely wouldn't want it to be hanging in a bag of feeds. That's going to take a couple hours to go through. All right. Make sure to monitor that your patients receiving enteral feeds and meds, uh, that those that are on enteral meds, that they have normal bowel elimination, right? So they're having regular bowel movements. You wanna make sure that you maintain their hydration status, right? And the way we do that is giving them those additional water flushes assessing for signs and symptoms of dehydration. Um, we want to promote coping and support and encouragement of our patient. We want to encourage them for self-care. We want them to be as involved as they can be, right, with their own feedings. Um, and of course, we're going to do lots of patient education about tube feedings, tube management feedings, how to ensure they don't get any blockages, all that, right? We definitely need to assess the patient's knowledge and ability to learn regarding their new gastrotomy or jejunostomy. We need to assess their ability and knowledge about how to do self-care, how to check their skin, how to check their own nutritional status or their fluid status, how they should inspect the tube, how to maintain care of the tube, all of those things, right? We need to monitor for complications, which would include wound infections, right? Which is the most common problem or complication, right? Wound infections are definitely the most common problem. Uh, but we also need to um, educate them on complications like cellulitis, leakage, GI bleeding, um, maybe dislodgement of the tube, blockage of the tube, uh, you know, like a tube obstruction. All of these things could be uh, problematic that we need to monitor them for and educate them on what to do, right? And then planning goals for your patient is the patient's major goals include attaining an optimal level of nutrition, preventing infection, maintaining skin integrity, adjusting to changes in their body image, preventing complications, um, and just their overall body enhancement, you know, their body image, enhancing their body image. All right, this is the end of the chapter on management of patients with oral and esophageal disorders.